Welcome to the house of the Lord. I'm Pastor David Rose now. God bless our time in his word. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. I'll offer the prayer of the day. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The word of God that is the foundation of the message today is recorded in Numbers chapter 21. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. The word of our God. Pastor James Pope will share our message today. Fellow worshipers of our Savior Jesus Christ, you probably have seen the sign somewhere, sometime, along a highway, maybe there is a sign that you can picture in your mind, it's yellow, typically, sometimes there's the word danger set in a red background. That sign is posted where there's an electrical power line overhead, and the sign says, look up and live. The sign is a warning for crane operators and other construction workers to be alert to power lines nearby. Despite those warnings, some 200 construction workers a year lose their lives because they come into contact with power lines. And so when people are working in a dangerous environment like that, it is critically important that they're paying attention to a sign like that and that they are looking up. We find something similar to that and a little bit different, too, in this account from Numbers chapter 21. There, it was not a matter of people looking up to avoid potential danger, but it was people looking up for help and relief and recovery. With the bronze serpent in the desert pointing ahead to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the message tonight focuses attention on Jesus and gives us this instruction to look and live. At the time these events in Numbers chapter 21 were taking place, the people of Israel were traveling in the wilderness. They had left Egypt in spectacular fashion. They were headed eventually toward the promised land and they were the recipients of God's gracious care. There's just no other way to put it. Psalm 78 gives us pretty good detail about how the Lord was taking care of his people during their stay in Egypt and then when they left and while they were traveling in the wilderness. Psalm 78 says he did miracles in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, the ten plagues. He divided the sea 
and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. He gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. They ate till they had more than enough, for he had given them what they craved. What amazing blessings from the Lord. What gracious care and treatment. And how did the people react? They grew impatient. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Can you imagine acting like that? I can. I'm the youngest of three brothers. And when we were very young, we were not always appreciative of the meals that my mom made for us on a pretty limited budget. And so we complained about the food here and there. On one day of complaining, our mom said to us, you know, there are people in the world who are so poor, all they have is rice to eat every day. At that point, one of my older brothers pointed to the food on the table and said something like, well, that wouldn't be so bad. Not a good thing to say, not a wise thing to say. The next day, my brothers and I had a bowl of rice for breakfast. The next day at lunch, we had a plate with rice on it. The next day at supper, we had actually our own little room in which we could eat, and there was a big helping of rice for each of us. Lesson learned. When the people of Israel complained about their diet, the Lord did not take away that miraculous food he had been giving them and instead give them wild rice. No, he sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. For the people of Israel, life suddenly became a lot more dangerous. The words of griping and complaint that came out of their mouth were replaced by cries and screams for help. Panic became the order of the day. The people sinned, and God brought a judgment for their sin into their lives. Aren't we glad God doesn't do that to us and do that all the time? King David in the 103rd Psalm wrote that the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Imagine what life would be like if God did treat us as our sins deserve, giving us a jolt here and there every time we did something wrong or not doing something right. As a just, holy God, God, of course, could do something like that if he wanted to. He had every reason to do that. God says, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Jesus said, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The bar is high, extremely high. And even one infraction of God's law is worthy of his anger and punishment. The Bible says the soul who sins is the one who will die. And the wages of sin is death. These are not happy thoughts, are they? They're not happy words to hear or happy words to speak. But this finally is the message and the purpose of God's law. To expose sin in our hearts and our lives and to point us to a solution for sin that lies beyond us and that's out of our hands. If you didn't know it, and I didn't know this till last week, the great American grump out day of this year is May 1st. For 20 years, the first Wednesday in May has been designated National Grump Out Day. And what's that all about, you wonder? The founders of that day said this, it's a day to focus on humor 
and positive behaviors in an effort to lighten up the mood and ward off grumpiness, crabbiness, and rudeness for 24 hours. I don't think an Israelite grump out day would have helped the people in the desert who are suffering from snake bites. None of their remedies would have helped them. They came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed. Moses prayed and God answered that prayer. And the prayer was for Moses to make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. That was the solution? Yes, look and live. But don't you think that the solution was different, slightly different, wildly different from what the people might have been expecting? Here they had been suffering, some were dying, because they had been bitten by snakes. Now the solution is to look at another snake, a bronze snake hoisted up on a pole. Maybe the last thing some of those people wanted to see was a snake again, but that's God's solution. God's solution was different. God's solution required faith. God's solution worked. Kind of like Jesus on the cross, right? In John chapter three, we hear about the cross of Christ being a fulfillment of a type in Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21 serves as a type of Christ pointing ahead in time to the work that Jesus would do on the cross. In John chapter 3, a man by the name of Nicodemus, a prominent Pharisee, came at night to talk to Jesus. He came to talk about the Bible. He wanted to understand the Old Testament scriptures better. Nicodemus asked questions, Jesus provided answers, and eventually their conversation turned to Numbers chapter 21. And Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then follows probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, spoken first to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. What happened in the desert with the snake on the pole was a prelude to a far greater healing that would affect far more than two million people in the desert. Jesus would be lifted up on a cross on a Friday that we call good. That cross, along with Jesus' holy life, would be God's solution for sin. And what a solution it is. But if some of the people in the desert rejected God's solution, thinking, what good is that going to do us? They would just have more suffering and pain, and death would finally come. They'd miss out on healing for their bodies. And just think of what people miss out, the healing for their souls that they miss out when they reject Jesus and the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 puts it this way, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Years ago when I was in college, I read a letter to the editor in our local newspaper. At the time I didn't know it was going to have a lifelong impression on me, but it did. When the letter was written, it was about this time of the year. A little bit later, we were getting close to Holy Week, and that's why the person wrote the letter. His letter went something like this. We're getting close to a time of the year for these people who call themselves Christians. And what's with those people anyway? They wear crosses as jewelry. They have crosses in church. Their pastors might wear crosses. Don't they know that a cross was a means of execution? Why wear something like that? It would make as much sense to wear a symbol of the modern day of executing someone. This was back in the 1970s, a little electric chair or a syringe for lethal injection. Message of the cross really is foolishness to those who are perishing, isn't it? But that passage from 1 Corinthians 1 goes on to say this, but to us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. 
and it's the wisdom of God. The cross of Christ is a symbol that looks back on the sacrifice that Jesus made. And that sacrifice removed sin. That sacrifice removed the guilt of sin and the shame of sin. And that sacrifice restored people to a perfect relationship with God. But of course, if there's no faith in Jesus, all those blessings are meaningless. But when the Holy Spirit changes hearts and connects people to faith in Jesus, then people can go through life absolutely confident that every sin has been forgiven and that when this life on earth comes to an end, we will be in the presence of God forever. And then, for Christians, the cross becomes a beautiful thing. Beautiful as in the titles of some of our hymns. In the cross of Christ, I glory. When I survey the wondrous cross, lift high the cross, the old rugged cross. But do you think people can ever make too much of the cross or misuse the cross? Certainly. You may remember an ABC News broadcaster from years ago named Paul Harvey. He relayed the news with commentary. He also had a little program called The Rest of the Story. And with that program, he would explain something about a person known, not well known. He would explain details, and then he would wind up his commentary by saying, and now you know the rest of the story. And there was usually a positive ending to that story. Well, there wasn't a positive ending to the rest of the story about the snake on the pole. When Moses put that snake on the pole, the time period was about 1450 BC. And now in your mind, fast forward about seven centuries, 700 years. We're in the land of Judah. The king is Hezekiah. He's a good king. He's carrying out reforms, spiritual reforms in the land. He's getting rid of idolatrous practices. He's removing things that people were using in their idolatrous practices. And then 2 Kings chapter 18 tells us this, King Hezekiah broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Can you imagine that? The people had hung on to that bronze serpent for years and years and years. And rather than it reminding them of God's gracious blessings, they repurposed it to be an instrument for idolatry. That's why the rest of the story for that is not so good. But the rest of the story for that man named Nicodemus is a good one from what we know. He came to Jesus at night to understand the scriptures better. But he doesn't disappear from the Bible after that. The next time we hear about him, he speaks up for Jesus. Some Pharisees had been meeting. They had nothing good to say about Jesus, but Nicodemus did. And then the next time we hear about Nicodemus is Good Friday. He and Joseph of Arimathea took the lifeless body of Jesus that had been lifted up on the cross, and they gave it a dignified burial for three days anyway. From what the Bible tells us, the rest of the story for Nicodemus was positive. But what about us? What about you? What about me? What's going to be the rest of the story for us? What will the rest of life bring to us? We don't know. God certainly knows. But we do know that this, that when the Holy Spirit changes hearts and connects us to Jesus in faith, then whenever life on this earth comes to an end, a new story will begin in heaven. A new story. That story won't have a happy ending. No, there'll be no ending whatsoever. It will be an eternity of happiness and joy and perfect glory. And our response, unending praise and glory to Jesus. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
got a short prayer written for today, and then I'll invite you to join together with me, and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to win our salvation and our eternal home with you in heaven. In this world that tries to cloud our eyes from seeing him, lift our eyes again and again to look and live. Please guide leaders at every level of government, big, small, here and around the world, so that we might enjoy your gifts of peace and the blessings of freedom. Please protect and guide all who are serving in our United States military and all who are working in public health and safety to keep us safe and free. For these things and for so many more, we ask you in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God bless and keep you in his tender loving care. And, Lord willing, I'll see you real soon.